So that is if our eigenvalues are lambda 1 equals 0, less than or equal to lambda 2, all the way up to lambda n, our again, eigenvalues of our Laplacian matrix. For our graph G, then the conclusion is that if you take 1 over n times the product of everything other than the trivial eigenvalue of 0, this is equal to the number of spanning trees of G. Now, we should mention, sometimes this is stated in a slightly different way. And I'll say that the slightly different way is that lambda 2 to lambda n is the number of something spanning trees of G. What goes in the, the, the blank? Well, everything's labeled. Rooted. Yeah. So in some sense, you can think about what's happening is that the 1 over n says we're removing the root. Because if you have an n vertex tree, and here we're talking labeled, so every vertex is distinguished by its label from every other vertex, the root can be any one of the n vertices. So this is another way that this is written. Now, one thing that is not immediately obvious, but we should at least mention in passing, is uh, this has to be an integer. Now, in other words, the product of the non-trivial eigenvalues has to be an integer. Now you might say, okay, well, is this immediately obvious or is it not immediately obvious? Uh, one thing to be clear about is eigenvalues can be messy. Uh, they tend to be algebraic. If we keep things simple, they're definitely algebraic. The reason I say tend to be you can do something weird and crazy, such as assigning weights to your edges, and then all bets are off. But assuming we keep things simple, your eigenvalues are algebraic, but, but as you know, algebraic does not mean easy to work with. And so your eigenvalues can be very messy. So is there an easy way to say that, other than the fact that we know it's counting something, you know, that if, if you can show that a certain thing counts something, then that's an easier way to say, oh, it has to be an integer. But even if we didn't know it counted something, is there an easy way to say, yes, this must be an integer? Uh, a thing for you to ponder. Spoiler alert, there is. You know, that's why I tend to ask these questions. Well, but it's not quite the determinant, because the determinant would involve zero. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if you, if you divide the determinant by zero, well, who knows what you get? Zero over zero. We can just say, yeah, zero over zero is always an integer, right? It's all of them at the same time. So. Yeah. <laughs> It does have something to do with the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. So if we look at our characteristic polynomial, I'll call it P sub L, just to emphasize the Laplacian. Well, uh, usually we, we think about expanding. And you can do cycle decompositions like we did before. However, cycle decompositions get interesting. And the reason they get interesting is now you have non-zero entries on the diagonal. And so you, you, loops come into play. But other than that technicality, one thing you can say is, look, your eigenvalues are what? Well, they're the roots. So it's x minus lambda 1, x minus lambda 2, so forth and so forth, on to x minus lambda n. And so if you expand, well, you get x to the n is your leading coefficient, and then minus well, you'll have lambda 1 plus lambda 2 
all the way plus lambda n x to the n minus 1. And we say, ah, well, hey, this expression, this has meaning. Do you remember what this is in terms of our graphs for the Laplacian? And one person is nodding. It's, it's, the, it's the same as a trace, which is the sum of the degrees, which we can also say is two times the number of edges. There's lots of ways to say this. Okay, and then it gets messy. But at the end, uh, what's going to be the very last term? It's going to be zero, because that's the determinant. What's the second to last term? Well, the second to last term, uh, I think these are called symmetric functions, is you say, okay, look at all ways that you can pick n minus one of the lambdas. And then you take the product of them and, and add up all the results. But when you do that, so there's, there's going to be something x here. We're, we can take advantage of the fact that we know that this is zero. And so what... Yeah, so the only thing that doesn't automatically disappear is lambda 2 to lambda n. Oh, I, I didn't have to write it so small. Okay, I'll write it a little bit bigger. Lambda, the product of lambda 2 to lambda n x. And so when you look at the characteristic polynomial of the Laplacian matrix, and you say, well, look at the coefficient for x, then this is the number of rooted spanning trees. And for anybody who happened to recently take the qual, you'll be like, oh, that's how you do that problem. So there was a recent qual problem. I think it may have been the most recent qual, where it was, we gave the, we gave the characteristic polynomial for the Laplacian, and we said, well, there's a bunch of, there's like five graphs on this number of vertices, which all have this same characteristic polynomial. And we gave the whole characteristic polynomial. We said, okay, give an upper bound and a lower bound for the size of the girth. And you might say, okay, well, how did the problem work? Well, you could count how many edges there were, and then you found out that it was like 15 vertices, 15 edges. You could tell that this coefficient for x was non-zero, and that tells you that the graph has to be connected. So how many connected well, what can you say about a connected graph where the number of vertices equals number of edges? It has one cycle, and exactly one cycle. It's unicyclic. And then we said, okay, if you look at this coefficient, it tells you how many spanning trees there are. Now, if you have a unicyclic graph, connected unicyclic graph, how many spanning trees are there? Hmm? Well, you, and you have to delete one edge on the cycle. Can you delete any edge on the cycle? Not if it has an R. Well, well, be careful. Any edge on the cycle. And so the, so the answer is the number of spanning trees of a unicyclic graph is the length of the cycle of the unicyclic graph. And so you're able to say, ah, I can now tell you it's a, it's a unicyclic graph, and here's, the, and here's the length of the only cycle it has. And then you might say, well, wait, wait, what about all this other information in the middle? It's called distraction. We distract you. And so you have to learn to ignore the distractions. But, uh, well, I wrote that problem. I, I will confess that most spectral graph theory problems on the quals are written by me. And so when, you, when I'm not on the committee, it's like, all right, either there's no spectral graph theory problem or it's not creative. So, one of those two things is true. So, oh yeah, yeah, that, that also happens. So, all right, anyways, so that's, uh, so that's how we know it's an integer because when you compute the characteristic polynomial, the Laplacian has all integer entries. So the characteristic polynomial has all integer entries. And so, so, so this has to be all integers. So that's the punchline. How do we know this is an integer? Okay. And uh, 
Well, all right. Now I feel bad. I didn't put that on on a homework. Well, I still can, I guess. You know, this is for people who came to class. You know, they get extra insider information. So. Oh, that's true. I guess. Yeah. Uh, so I think I wanted to talk about a couple of things today, and uh, so one of the things I want to talk about, it, it came up a bit in our conversation last time. We, we talked about when we were finding the number of, of spanning trees, and, you know, we said zero, less than or equal to lambda one, less than or equal to lambda two, so forth and so on, and someone said, well, wait, what if lambda two is zero? I said, well, well yeah, that's a great, great question. If lambda two is zero, then the product is zero, but we also can't have any spanning trees. And so we already know that lambda two can tell us something very roughly. We know that this, if this is equal to zero, then the graph is disconnected, meaning there's more than one component. And if it's not zero, then the graph is connected. But then people came along and said, well, wait a second, can you, can you do better than that? Because this is very on-off switch kind of feeling. So it turns out you can. And in particular, lambda 2 has a name. So lambda 2, this is called the Fiedler eigenvalue. It really is a name, yeah. I, I, I hope I spelled it correctly. I'm pretty sure I did. So there's a Fiedler eigenvalue. And uh, it, roughly speaking, here's the intuition. So lambda 2 small, like we know lambda 2 zero means disconnected. So uh, lambda 2 small means it's near zero. Then it's poorly connected. And, I, and I'm going to be very vague about this because I, I really want to save this discussion for a different matrix. But lambda too large, then that somehow indicates well connected. And, and so poorly connected, well connected, there, there's a, a conversation to be had about what all that means. Well, it's just their size in comparison to zero, usually. Or you might say in terms of like how large it is compared to n. So usually that's how people look at it. They say, because they'll say things like, is it, uh, I mean, it, it, at biggest it can be, you know, what's the best case scenario? Well, the best case scenario is the complete graph. And in the complete graph, the value is n. And you can't do better than that. But the complete graph turns out to, it's very well connected. You know, it's like the complete graph knows everybody. It gets invited to all the parties. That's why it's so connected. So, uh, but, uh, but then I say, well, what's an example of a graph which is poorly connected? Well, the path graph is poorly connected. And if you look at the eigenvalues, they're very small, all of them are. And, uh, and one of them is very close to zero. And so, again, I'm not being very precise here. I will be more precise in a, a different spectrum, because there are different spectrums out there. Now, that's the Fiedler eigenvalue, but there is something else to talk about, which is the Fiedler eigenvector. And any guess what that is? That yeah, it's the associated eigenvector for lambda 2. Now, of course, you might get to a scenario where lambda 2 is repeated and then, all right, whatever. But well, let's just assume lambda 2 is not repeated. Just it makes our conversation a little bit more interesting to talk about. Now, what can you do with the Fiedler eigenvector? You know, what does the eigenvector tell you about a graph? And so this, this would be a great time for me to actually have computed ahead of time some eigenvectors associated with the graph. And I did not. <laughs> so I'm going to wave my hands quite a bit 
in the following statements I'm about to make. Uh, but uh, what happens is people said, okay, uh, first off, we know that the Fiedler eigenvector has to be perpendicular to the all ones. Why is this? Yeah, because we know the I ones I ones eigenvectors already been accounted for, so it has to be perpendicular. Well, so in particular, we see that there are some entries of V two are positive, some entries of V two are negative, and what they saw, and uh, I, I hope Peter is one of them who saw it, but you never know with naming conventions in math. Sometimes they name things after people who weren't heavily involved. But, but in this case, I'm pretty safe to say Fiedler was involved. They said, well, if you, if you split your vertices to, say, places where V2 is positive and V2 is negative, that it tends to be relatively few edges in between. So in other words, it gives you a way to sort of partition your graph. And there's a topic called spectral partitioning. And this is, when you hear that discussion, this is what it's referring to. It says, okay, take your eigenvectors and use it to, to split your graph up. And now you, you can say, well, V2 positive, V2 negative. You can even be a little bit more subtle, and we will get into this again in more detail in the future, but as I wave my hands, you can say, well, look, if I look at the entries of V2, I can order them because they're real numbers. And I can just sort of say, okay, where, where are they at? And there's you know, some sort of scattershot around. And what you can do is, is you can use that to say, okay, suppose you were looking for cuts. So when I talk about a cut, I can think about saying I want to cut my graph into two big blobs. Now, the thing is, there's a lot of candidates. If I have n vertices, essentially there's two to the n different ways I can split it into two parts. And so, okay, that's a lot of possibilities. And so testing each individual one and saying what's the best among them is hard one of those classical hard problems. And uh, so there's a question, well, what if you say, I'm willing to compromise. I, I'm not, I don't have to have the best cut possible. I just have to have a good cut. Can I find something which doesn't take exponential time, or exponentially in many cases, can I find something which takes uh, sort of order n cases. And using the first eigenvector is actually a reasonable way to do it. And what you do is you order the vertices according to their value, and then you cut you know, on e between each possible place. And so that gives you different cuts, and you say, okay, so there's, you know, here's one side versus you know, the other side. And now you just say, well, what's happening with these? And uh, in certain cases, you can show that this actually, you, you, you only have order n possibilities to go through, but you will be within a very reasonable amount of best possible. So that's something that happens. Uh, you can also have a little bit of fun with not just the first eigenvector, V2. Uh, I call it the first one because, you know, all ones is not interesting. You can combine, say, the eigenvector for V2 and the eigenvector for V3, and you can think about, well, from V2 I get values, and from V3 I get values. So what I'll do is for each vertex, I now have a pair. You know, the X coordinate comes from V2 eigenvector, the Y coordinate comes from V3 eigenvector. Now that I have a pair, I can plot. And so I can put put vertices down. And uh, if you do that, uh, you, can, you can get, uh, I don't know the formal term for this, but you can get spectral graph drawing. In other words, you can use these eigenvectors to get pictures of your graphs. And it turns out that it does a really good job in some cases. 
In other cases, it does a really bad job in that it stacks vertices on top of each other. But when you have symmetry, it does a surprisingly nice job of highlighting that. And so this is one way that people can use to, to get a picture drawn of their graphs. All right, so that's one thing I wanted to mention. And uh, the other thing I, I wanted to mention is we've been calling it the Laplacian. Are we justified in that? And uh, so time for us to do a little bit of soul searching. Why is it called the Laplacian? Which is sort of strange given that this is our last thing we're going to talk about. Usually this should be like the first thing we talk about. So for people who aren't familiar with combinatorics, and you hear phrases like the Laplacian, what do you think of? So you have to channel, like, pretend I'm not somebody who knows graph theory. Laplacian operator. Okay, which means what? I think of it for two variables, so it takes, it's a, if you have a function of two variables, then it mm -hmm. uh, takes the second derivative with respect to x and adds it to the second derivative with respect to y. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make it minus fxx minus fyy equals zero. Something like that. I'm just going to wave my hands for a second. And just say, OK. But really, you know, in some sense, we, we, we care about that. Now, usually it's plus and not minus. But there's reasons why I want to do minus and not plus. All right. So now I want to do a little bit of a, of a detour. Numerical approximation. It's all the rage. So in particular, um, I want to talk about numerical approximation of the second derivative. I don't know if you've ever gone into discussions about this, but suppose you have a computer and you say, well, I want to get a nice approximation for the second derivative. Uh, how, how could one do it? Well, what we can do is, uh, well, okay. I'll, I'll just write something down for right now and uh, then we'll discuss. Limit as h goes to zero of minus f of x minus h plus 2 f of x minus f of x plus h over h squared. I think that does it. Well, maybe. Maybe not. What is this? Right. It feels like, you know, the, the, it kind of feels like the definition of derivative. Kind of, sort of, in a kind of, sort of way. Okay, so, so channel your inner Calc 1 student. Your, you know, your innocent, ah, I see the world through rose-colored glasses. What would you do if you were an, your, your, your inner calculus student? What would you want to do? Well, just to figure out what it is. Oh. Yeah. This is a sum of two. Really? We could do that. <laughs> huh. That sounds complicated. That sounds like an inner calc three child when you start saying directional derivatives. I would, I would like to factor out a one over h, maybe. And I want to split things up. Okay. Uh, what if there are? I don't know what you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. If you're trying to figure out what it uh, is. Coming. What does it go to when you plug in zero? Oh, I see. You want to suggest plug in zero. <laughs> it goes to zero or zero, right? Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so what, what do you do? Well, that's an integer. That's yeah, l'hôpital. Sure. Le <laughs> 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 I'm not sure. L'hôpital. 
Okay, so this is the same as the limit as h goes to zero. Okay, downstairs is easy. That's two h. Now, what, what's the derivative of the top? Now remember, x is not the variable. H is the variable. It's h. It's minus f of x minus h. It'll be plus. Well, minus and minus makes plus. F prime. F prime of x minus h. Okay, the middle term? Zero. The last term? Minus f prime of x plus h. Minus f prime of x plus h. Okay, what does this go to? Zero over zero. Zero over zero. So what should we do? Le hopital. <laughs> Limit as h goes to zero. Downstairs is two. Upstairs? Negative double prime, x minus h, minus x plus h. Now the good news is, we're not going to zero over zero anymore, because there's a two. So what do we go to? If the second derivative is continuous, you're good. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll assume it's that. It's not one, so. Yeah. <laughs> so it goes to minus f double prime of x. All right. So there's a minus sign, but that's okay. I, I put a minus sign, so we wanted a minus sign. All right, so what does this say? Well, this, this is, of course, a fun little exercise, but now this is not numerical approximation. This is just... I feel like I'm missing something. What are you missing? Well, how, do, how did you get that last equals? H is the variable. Yeah, H goes to zero. So minus F double prime of X, minus F double prime of X. It's so minus 2f double prime of x, divide by 2. Thank you. 2 in the denominator is what so. I asked. <laughs> All right. Now, I haven't said numerical approximation. This just says this is, this is true. This is a way to get f double prime as a limit. So one thing we can do is if we have our values spaced out evenly on a line, and we want to get a numerical approximation, but well, we say, look, if I want to know what's happening at this point for the second derivative, I can take 2 times where I'm at and combine it with minus 1 of what's before and minus 1 of after. And that helps get me a numerical approximation for the second derivative. OK? I do not know what you well, uh, well now, no. now, now think, of, think of this as like h equals 1. I got it. So, <laughs> so if plug in h equals 1, then now you get a squiggly, right? And then you'll get minus f of x minus 1 plus 2f of x minus f of x plus 1 is a, a very rough approximation to f double prime. So it says if, I'm, if I have a lot of numerical values here, then if I take 2 times the current entry and combine it with minus 1 of the entries just before and after, that's acting like the second derivative. Well, it's acting as the negative of the second derivative. Yeah. All right. Well, now a question. Suppose you have a line and you want to discretize it, split it into parts. What's the right graph to think of using? to help discretize the line. Graph. <laughs> no, no, we're talking about the line graphs later, <laughs> later on. So I'm thinking about, when I talk about the line, I'm thinking about R. What, what's the right kind of, what's the right kind of, of graph structure to, to best approximate? Well, of course, we have to do finite. Yes. So everyone wants to say a path, but the correct answer is a cycle. Yes. We, we use a big cycle to... So, so the moral is, if you, want to, if you want to approximate the line, use a big cycle. So why? Well, the problem with, with a path graph is it's great in the middle, but the ends are not great. <laughs> and because they just behave differently, and, and so that behavior at the ends is bad. Whereas if you just take a very big cycle, 
then locally everything looks like like the the line, you know. Everything has neighbors on both sides. So every everything's happy all the way around. So all right. So now we're almost done. We're almost done. And if if you think about the Laplacian matrix of the cycle, what does it look like? Twos on the diagonal, minus ones, and then minus ones in the far corners. And now, if you if you think about x1, x2 down to xn, what it's doing is that each vertex it takes two times the current value of that vertex and minus one of on the one on the other, that side and minus one on the other side. So this is essentially when we think about this as y1, y2, yn, this is the second, der well, second derivative with, I'll put a minus sign, so minus sign second derivative a numerical approximation. Now you might say, okay, well that's great if I just wanted the minus fxx. What if I want to do minus fyy? Well then which graph do you use? Well, you need something two-dimensional. Okay, okay. So what's a nice two-dimensional graph? Cartesian product of paths. Cartesian product of paths is a great idea, but of course you still have the unfriendly of edges cycles. of cycles. Yeah. And so, so what you get is a torus. Indeed. <laughs> and I'll just say that these edges wrap around without drawing them as wrapping around. And if you go through and you actually carry out the computation, then what happens is when you multiply by the Laplacian matrix, it's a numerical approximation of what's happening with the Laplacian operator. So there is a, a, a connection. Now, that's why I think it's called the Laplacian. So, anyways. Just a, a side note, a little, little fun historical references. Okay. Wait, what, so why did you say you called it zero at the beginning? <coughs> hmm? Oh, I, I shouldn't. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just so used, I'm, I'm so used to right now, I'm in like differential equations right now, and so I'm just like, everything needs to have an equal sign. And uh, so that's why I'm, I'm uh, that's, okay. So we talked about the Laplacian, but uh, minus signs. God, can we be more optimistic? And the answer is yes. There's something called the signless Laplacian matrix. And uh, well, just hearing the name signless Laplacian, how do you think it should be defined? Yeah, exactly right. So where the signless Laplacian is the diagonal matrix of degrees minus the adjacency, the signless Laplacian, which for some reason often we use a Q for, is D plus the adjacency. Okay, so this is our Laplacian, and this is our signless Laplacian. Now there's a couple of things which are easy. We'll go ahead and get the low-hanging fruit out of the way. If you add up the eigenvalues of your Laplacian, what do you get? Two times the number of edges. So you can definitely detect the number of edges. All right. Uh, if you take, well, x star qx. Now, we did this for the Laplacian matrix. I'm going to sort of skip the intermediate steps. I claim it's still nice. In other words, it's still the sum of all the edges, but what changes? This might be helpful to remind yourselves what x star Lx looks like. That's the sum i adjacent to j, xi minus xj. 
It is xi plus xj. Yes. Yes. Nice. All right. So here's uh, uh, let's see. We have time. Yeah, we can do this. The multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue. What does that tell us? I, I should pause for a second and say, we lose something huge. And uh, I'll demonstrate this with a graph. We'll do it here. Let's say this is our graph. And uh, can you figure out what I'm going to say we lose before I actually get a chance to write down this? Yes. Yes. I know how you feel. We've lost the all ones. The all ones is not a guaranteed eigenvector. Indeed, um, there are some cases where it will be. But in order for the all ones to be an eigenvector, it has to be regular, is what it basically boils down to. So the all ones <sighs> makes it harder to do things with this matrix. But nevertheless, we can. OK, so multiplicity of 0 as an eigenvalue. So Suppose we knew that 0 was equal to x star qx. What would that force? So force xi has to equal negative xj for each edge. So what does that say? Suppose you. We, Suppose I have a five cycle. And let's say, I don't know, let's say this is three. What would this value have to be? Minus three, and then? Three, and then? And then? We don't know. Three, but then? Minus three. This would have to be minus three. But then? But it's not true. So the problem is you can't be consistent. So if you have an odd cycle, you run into problems. Okay, so clearly no odd cycles, so it'll be like hard Right, so odd cycles equals bad. Well, really it's not odd cycles equals bad, odd cycles equals zero. Because once you have an odd cycle, it forces everything on that odd cycle to be zero, because the only way you can have something be equal to the negation of itself is to be zero. Well, that's for that odd cycle, but then anything connected to it then propagates and makes zero. So anything with an odd cycle has to zero out. So any component with an odd cycle has to zero out. What if you're bipartite, as has been mentioned by several people? Then what happens? Then the sum of the... One of them will be positive. The sums have to cancel out, but that just means... Like the the parts have to have the same value, yeah. right? Or and they have to be negative. Right. So if you have a bipartite piece, then you're you're you can be okay. You just like make plus a and minus a, you know, as you go across. So what does the multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue tell us? I'm I'm hand waving a bit, but in a second here we'll we'll. Well, kind of. It, it's something about the number of. It's the number of bipartite components. Yeah. So, the the we we think about each individual component. What happens on each component? If your component has an odd cycle, it, it's forced to be all zeros. If your component is bipartite, then you get one degree of freedom, namely, you know, what's this value you pick, and so. Uh, that says that the, the degree of freedom you have for, for zero is the number of bipartite components. Uh, by the way, we should have pointed out x star qx is always greater than or equal to zero. So what does that say about our eigenvalues? Yeah, all eigenvalues are greater than or equal to zero. It's positive semi-definite. And again, if you look at the, you can see this directly from the matrix, it's, it's uh, diagonally dominant. Okay, so the multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue 
is equal to the number of bipartite components. So you can tell how many bipartite components you have. Does that mean that you can tell how many components you have? No. Can you tell if your graph is connected or not? No. And there's examples. So if you take a triangle with a single vertex and then you compare it to a star on four vertices, these both have the same spectrum for Q. But one of them is connected and the other one's not. But it doesn't contradict anything that we've done because a single vertex is considered bipartite. And you might say, well, wait, how can a single vertex be bipartite? You can't split that into two parts. Yeah, you can. One of them is empty. Yeah, one of the parts is empty, and then you're still fine. You can say all edges go between the two parts. And that's a wonderful statement because it's vacuously true. When there's no edges, you can prove a lot. So it, it turns out. Is it, uh, is it notable that those graphs are complements of each other? Uh, or is this just a coincidence? I think it's a coincidence in this case. Okay. But uh, it might work. I don't, think, I don't think it's quite as nice for complements. Okay. Mostly it's probably just ran out of edges. Okay, now, but here's the fun part. When I like the sign of the Laplacian, I like the following. We, go, we get to go back to just the normal incidence matrix. And so as a reminder, we... Uh, what, what, what was our symbol for incidence matrix? We said T was the signed incidence matrix. What do we, what do we want to use for our incidence matrix? S. Okay, sure. S. And... The original matrix, you said S. This is X or S. So we have our vertices indexing our rows, our edges indexing our columns. And the nice thing here is with the incidence matrix, it, it does what you think it should do. So you see a 1, and, and a single one. So there's, there's a one and another one. We don't have to think about wait, which one is the minus because that doesn't come into play. So what happens if we take S times S transpose? I'm sorry, what? I'm guessing we get our Q. Yes, yes, you get Q. Great. Wonderful. Now, this is the same argument as T, T transpose is the Laplacian. What you do is you just think about S, S transpose is you're looking of, of dot products of rows and rows. So if you take a dot product of a row with itself, that's how many edges you get. And so that tells you the diagonal is the degree. And if you take the dot product of two different rows, it's either zero if there's not an edge connecting those two vertices, or it's a one if there is an edge. Now, the fun part. S transposed S. Okay. So, let's talk about the size. It's now a tall matrix times a short matrix, which means we're going to get a big matrix out at the end. What are our, what's the indexing going to be? Yeah, so edges. Edges index both the columns and the rows. Now, the question you may say is, okay, well, what are the entries going to be? Well, when we did SS transpose, it was a dot product of a row with a row. When we do S transpose S, it's the dot product of column and column. So let's do column with itself. If I take a, a dot product of a column with itself, what will I get? Two. two. Well, in this case, I will, but will always be two. And the answer is yes, because each edge has two vertices. And what you're doing is when you take the dot product of, of, of a column with itself, it's how many vertices are in that edge. So the diagonal, that's kind of cool. That's just straight twos. Awesome. Now, off diagonal, what will you have? Well, that'll be a 
col you know, we're taking dot product of two columns, so we might have something where the dot product is, is one, and then of course we could have things where the dot product is zero. So what distinguishes those? It's a share of vertex. Right. It, it does feel a lot like the adjacency matrix for edges. So, so in the off diagonal, you're going to be one if uh, edges share vertex. Okay, I'm obviously not gonna have enough space. Okay. One, if edges share vertices. I like the way that you've described it. Zero, if no common vertex. Okay, cool. So it feels kind of like two times the identity added to a zero one matrix. Now when we think zero one matrices, we think adjacency matrix. The adjacency matrix of what? And it's the adjacency matrix of the line graph. And we'll pick up there next time because we're out of time.